Labs has been working on the first exhibition of the Corcoran Collection since its partial dissemination to the American University Museum. Our tentative title, Moves Like Walter, New Curators Find Signs of Life in the Corcoran Legacy Collection, pays in a humorous homage to an American curator of contemporary art, Walter Hobbs. Hobbs was known for being erratic, challenging, and off schedule. However, it has been stated that he has always brought a personal and fierce perspective to exhibition making. By using Hobbes as a curatorial model, our group hopes to create an exhibition that does not exclude any thoughts. We will not clean up into neat statements. Instead, we hope to break rules, open as many dialogues as possible, and engage in surprising conversations about history, art, institutions, and people. Creating this exhibition has prompted unexpected and challenging responses. As a group, we hope that viewing of this exhibition will prompt similarly intriguing thoughts. I teach a class on curatorial practice every couple of years, and it came around right after we received the collection, and it was a little before we'd really managed to sort of, you know, even catalog it all, and, uh, but it became a work in progress. My students got access to the collection, the first people too. Their job was to put together an exhibition that uh, meant something, you know, that, uh, that might be important. And for me, it was the idea of young curators coming into a collection basically formed in the late 19th, early 20th century and see what's relevant today. So it answers the question, what are you going to do with the collection? Well, this is one great educational opportunity provided by that collection. I've been working on an organizational plan for the Corcoran Show. So I thought it would be best to start with something very interrogative and then end with something very personal. So I think it would be best if we start the exhibition with American Legacy, Reconsidering Non-Western Subjects in the Corcoran Collection. We are interested in investigating the way race has been pictured and collected within the Corcoran Collection. What images of minorities has the Corcoran been interested in? What has been naturalized about race within the collection? What has the Corcoran chosen to be suitable as an, quote, American legacy, which is found in their mission statement? My look at non-Western subjects in the Corcoran collection takes the approach of a comparison between two works that represent a gendering of the Orient in contrasting ways. I will look at uh, Rebecca at the Well, uh, like Mike, and Tanya Antonisha's The Turkish Bath. Antonisha is a contemporary female artist whose photographs reimagine famous works of the art historical tradition. Her Turkish Bath is a 1999 work that directly comments on the representation of gender and nudity in Jean-Auguste Dominique Ang's famous painting of the same name from over a hundred years previous. Looking through the works, I noticed that most depictions of non-Western subjects were not created by people of color. The work titles are Canton Street by Frederick Barrett and a photograph by Joseph Rock of a Chinese man. Both works are produced by Americans who traveled to China during the early 20th century. What their representation said about China shapes Americans' concept of this country. Part of it still lasts today. These two works are part of the process of creating this image of China. We see this as an opportunity for intervention. While arts institutions have progressed significantly since the founding of the Corcoran Collection in terms of diversity and representation, there is still a long way to go. We see the critiquing of a major American art collection as the next step in the journey. The rural south is a wild and tameable beauty. Thomas Schuller and Stephen Zarbo's Eastern Shore portfolios show the untouchable majesty of dirt roads and forests that twist indistinguishably from the wild flowers and loom over tepid waters of the south. It is a perfect vignette of scented honeysuckles and majestic magnolias inviting all travelers to get lost in its vast wanderlust. These photographers capture the nostalgia of place in a way that is so unique to most. At first glance, the photographs are sullen and unremarkable, but look deeper and you see a comforting sentimentality that only places of home and belonging elicit. 
Well, the first rule of curating is uh, never curate by committee, and of course that's kind of what we did. However, uh, they managed to sort of break into about five groups and each take a, a theme of uh, relevance to their own lives, you know, whether it's you know, how are people of color represented, uh, how are women portrayed, why are they all topless, <laughs> they uh, looked at the, the way children are portrayed. I think the exhibition honors the Corcoran, it also uh, takes a very critical look at the Corcoran. Uh, that's what I loved about the students, they went in not sort of blindly, you know, bowing to, you know, art history as it was seen in the late 19th, early 20th century. They actually dug deep and found out, you know, what were the prejudices that were going on. And they used the Corcoran collection to sort of understand their own history, you know, how things got to be the way they are today. Our group's title is called Redefining the Gaze, uh, Shifting the Power. And so what we're going to be focusing on uh, are women subjects and how in this Corcoran collection uh, that we've received, how they've been portrayed by different genders and through different mediums. Throughout this exhibition, we're going to be comparing and contrasting um, different uh, perspectives on the female nude. Um, and particularly juxtaposing women photographers photographing women um, with uh, paintings of women that were done by majority of male artists. But I think in general we uh, see how the difference in the artist's gender really uh, makes a different uh, image of what a woman is and what her femininity is. The section that I'm working on is women photographers photographing women. And what I'm looking at is um, a grouping of photographs taken in the 1970s and the 1980s, which is at the same time that we're having the second wave of feminism in both art and the United States. For instance, with Ruth Bernhardt, here she is a nude in a box, but she's falling outside of the box. So are women's roles changing? So our exhibit is called Boundless, Existing Within an Ambiguous Space, and Carol Sockwell's story fits perfectly into that, and his art fits really well into that. On top of highlighting a black artist, we are highlighting two women artists from the D.C. area, um, Minnie Clavins and Marjorie Nidio, and uh, they're also AU alumna, so we are enjoying the opportunity to be able to highlight that. Our goal in this exhibition is basically to prove that abstract art is still relevant, be it expressionist or gestural abstract art. Uh, our exhibition is titled Selfless Spirit, Nature versus Nurture and the Effects of Motherhood in Cochrane Collection. It will focus on the intimate relationships between mother and, ch and her children. It will portray various themes and interactions of mother's selfless spirit with the world separated into the child's experience. The mother's experience and collective experience or you, me, us. We chose this subject because childhood is a universal experience and the mother-child relationship is a deeply personal theme. Our goal is to create an intimate and unifying link between the viewer and the Corcoran collection. In 2014, the Corcoran Gallery of Art closed and the Attorney General of Washington ordered that the collection be uh, dispersed to Washington institutions and that process was handled by the National Gallery of Art and each institution in Washington made proposals for what they wanted and what they'd do with it and so we made our proposal and uh, they liked it. The collection is about 17,000 pieces and we ended up with about 9,000 pieces. We call the what we got the Corcoran Legacy Collection, it really is tries to keep intact major parts of the collection, whether it's William Clark's uh, collection he gave or Olga Hirshhorn's collection she gave. Uh, tried to keep it together, tried to focus on women artists and artists of color and uh, in American art. I'm sitting in the second floor where this show is going to be. The second floor is now dedicated to our collections. 
So every time you come back, you're going to see a little bit of the history of Washington, and you're also going to see hopefully challenging and provocative work like we do on the rest of the floors. I'm going to be working on reframing uh, within the juxtaposition of female bodies painted predominantly by men and photographs by women. Reframing examines how the mediums of painting and photography allow for different representations of women within the Corcoran collection. Why do the tropes and motifs of the idolized and sexualized woman remain stagnant in painting? And why does photography allow for a diverse representation of women across context, race, and age? These series of painting, whether they are nude or in clothing, express each individual's willingness to be themselves in their most beautiful way. The variety of women allows the visitors to create an open discussion on the roles of women in the history of women in arts. What does the Corcoran Collection normalize within its representations of women? The Corcoran Collection contains a large array of paintings of women, including nude women, but the gender of the painters represented in the Corcoran Collection are predominantly male. By interjecting photography of women by women photographers, representing proposes the question not only of how women differently portray their gender, but why such an unequal distribution of paintings in the collection are painted by men. So my exhibition is entitled The Road Home. It uses landscape photography to kind of elicit nostalgia from childhood or memories of your home. If you close your eyes and think of home, what images come to mind? Do you see sunshine? Rain? Is it colorful or faded? I see woods that I used to pretend were my castle. Trees that I would climb and wish for a treehouse that I would never have. I think of stories of my family, my mother and father who worked in tobacco fields and lived in small farmhouses. I remember seeing them many years later and crying. The photos and paintings in this exhibition bend our understanding through movement, space, relation of the body. The work challenges to see past what we have experienced and know thus far. In this exhibition, our understanding beyond its limitations. Time travel is possible, movement is infinite, and form could take on any element or material. So education and reflection is an important aspect of the Corcoran Collection. As art is a reflection of culture, abstraction is a significant subject that allows the artist the freedom of expression, the ability to experiment with form and challenge reality. Well, you can see how much fun we've been having here. So this exhibition and gallery talk are designed to answer the question on everybody's lips when it was announced we would be receiving 9,000 works from the Corcoran Collection. The question was, what are you going to do with it? I put that question to my curatorial practice class, uh, the students nine months ago, I have enjoyed working with them so much as they dove into the collection. Uh, tonight we have three of the new curators with us to talk about the process and the results of their curatorial practice. Three wonderful volunteers. Uh, Erica Bryant-Northcutt, right there, is a 2015 graduate of the University of South Carolina School of Music. She holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in music with extensive study and performance in Japan before beginning her graduate studies at American University in Arts Management. Uh, Abby Swearingham is an MA candidate in the Art History Program at American University specializing in post-war, modern, and contemporary American art. She is currently writing her thesis on Joan Mitchell's painting, White Territory. She earned a BFA in painting and art history from the Kansas City Art Institute in 2018. She is currently the gallery operations and administrative coordinator at the American University Museum. Michael Ki Twisaka is an MA candidate in art history at American University, specializing in 19th century American painter Thomas Cole. He received a BA in art history from Marymount Manhattan College in 2017 and is currently a fellow for the Alper Institute for Washington Art 
at the American University Museum. So I believe you're going to ask me questions first. Uh, we wanted to kind of flip it on you and ask you some questions. Uh -huh. and since you've been asking us questions for nine months. <laughs> so Jack, can you tell us about how the American University came to receive this gift and what is the process of receiving such a large gift? And to reiterate, 9,000 pieces. So the Corcoran closed in 2014, and the Attorney General of DC uh, gave the National Gallery of Art responsibility for selecting what they wanted from the collection and distributing the rest to DC cultural institutions. Uh, they solicited proposals, and we were to explain what we wanted and what we would do with it. So we went after work by women, uh, people of color, Washington art, American art, and the makings of a good teaching collection. Uh, you would have, you'd have to ask the registrar about the mechanics of receiving 9,000 works. I can tell you we're in the process of raising a lot of money to take care of it and make it accessible. It represents a great opportunity for American University and its students and also a great responsibility. So Jack, when you saw that this collection was available, how did you see it? How did you see this collection aligning with the mission statement for the museum? Well, we've been very, very involved in the uh, local community. You know, we feel this is a big part of our mission, to be good neighbors and to uh, work with this uh, great city. The Corcoran Gallery of Art was the center of art in Washington for many years. Uh, we believe it's our responsibility to use the Corcoran Legacy Collection uh, as a resource for Washington, to place ourselves at the center, to attempt to fill a terrible void left by the departure of the Corcoran. We know we can't do that, but we... We can attempt, and I think around you, you can see that, um, that we may be able to accomplish a few things uh, along those lines. So can you tell us about your ideas when you were coming up with this class? Why students, and how often do students get to curate in exhibitions in this museum? So I've been teaching curatorial practice every two years, and... Um, We've never before worked with a collection. Basically, they would go out into the community and try to you know, figure out a way to put together an exhibition that uh, would be meaningful to them. But here we had a great opportunity uh, to work with the collection. Also, there were great restrictions in working with the collection. We, you know, we were just receiving it, so a lot of it wasn't completely accessible. Uh, so we limited it basically to paintings and photography. And, um, and tried to figure out how we could make that available to you, how you could go about it. And maybe you can, I'll be asking you in a little bit how you actually went about trying to do it. Because it wasn't easy, you know. You, I mean, 9,000 works, you know. I mean, one work is a problem, right? You know, but 9,000 works is like overwhelming. So uh, we've been slowly sort of getting a handle on it and trying to, you know, be able to use it the way it should be used. And I think you were the big first experiment in, in how to do that. Yeah, and thank you for that, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you're gonna ask us this question too, but we wanted to pose it to you. What made you the most proud about this whole process? And what would you say was the hardest thing about this whole process? Well, what made me proudest was the results. I mean, this is, uh, I think it's a pretty, you know, wonderful, interesting, and fresh look at a venerable collection. Uh, so I like that very much, that this is not, maybe this isn't entirely typical, you know, of how might somebody approach a collection like this, that, that you guys really found your own answers. And, and that, was, that was great. Uh, but, you know, my poor staff, you know, had to deal with 18 curators and, uh, you can imagine the sort of the, the chaos around trying to get deadlines met and uh, essays done and uh, selections made and 
you know, just figuring out what you wanted to show and what could be shown, what needed restoration, what needed to be framed, what, you know, there were like amazing amounts of uh, uh, problems in doing the show. Uh, but that's what makes it exciting, you know, because I, I don't think it would be expected that we could pull this off like immediately upon receiving the collection. So I think you did a, you did a wonderful job in that regard. Yeah, thank you to the staff for yes, getting this done. Mm -hmm. And now, Jack, I believe you have some questions for us. So I'd like each of you to talk a little bit about the process that you went through in putting this show together. Uh, you know, talk a little bit about the difficulties of getting access to it and how you were able to get into it and make your decisions to come up with these five you know, sort of semi-coherent uh, mini-shows and, and make them all come together at the same time. Yeah. Anybody like to start? Do you want to start, Kelly? Do you want to start? Um, so, for the process of curating the show, we actually just started with going to facilities to look at some of the work. Um, of course, we weren't able to look at all 9,000 works, but I would say that we looked at maybe, we started with paintings, that was what was being received at first, and there were maybe about 200 of them. And most of the students sort of, we walked through the racks and had a little inclination at some of the certain works. Um, as we proceeded forward, we ended up receiving um, digital PDFs of work. We weren't able to see everything in person, but that was sort of a way for us to start expanding what, we, what was available to us. Um, and that's how many ideas started forming for many of the groups. Um, we also ended up, as far as accessing certain works, we would go to facilities throughout the semester and work with the registrar as well, um, sort of one-on-one, -on -one. Um, looking through files, um, ordering catalogs on past exhibitions for research, um, and stuff like that. And just to jump on that, Jack, you mentioned the difficulty of accessibility, but to be quite honest, you just kind of took us down to the storage facility. You were like, go at it. There you go. Here they are, and that for yeah, like, my registrar, I really love that. <laughs> <laughs> but like to be quite honest, that was the best part because uh, some of the best times that we had in the class was going down to the facility and checking out just painting after painting, photograph after photograph, and uh, it brought in completely randomly. You know, they yeah. it came in by pallet, yeah, uh, in in random assortments. So it was an uh, interesting challenge. Well, and what an opportunity too. Yeah. I agree. Sorry, are you finished? Oh, I just wanted to say that, like, I just wanted to say that um, on top of just being around the art, it was getting to know everybody based on, oh, what do you think of that? Oh, what, what do you think of this? Like, oh, I love this kind of work. I don't really like this kind of work, but this one is, a, is an exception to that. You know? So um, getting to talk to Abby and seeing what she wanted, getting to talk to other people in our group, and that's when the ideas started forming, I would say. I, I would have to say again, being able to go to the facility and be around that art was quite a life-changing opportunity for me because I grew up in the rural south where, you know, you had to drive two and a half hours to go get to a, a decent art museum, I mean, or any art museum, not even a decent one. And <laughs> Exactly, right? And so to be there and to be so close that you can see the rivets in, in the paint and, and see the blood, sweat, and tears that go into it, it's, it's such an opportunity and I think really part of the heart of, of what the Corcoran Collection uh, at AU is about is, is this learning opportunity to be able to uh, give people the opportunity who wouldn't ever have the opportunity to work with this kind of, these kind of paintings or photographs and I think that really speaks to the integrity of the university, not, not only that but to also the Corcoran Collection in and of itself. Um, but as far as difficulty, I felt like, you know, as far as registrar and things like that, they made it very easy because you could go in and make an appointment with Carla and, and then you were kind of a kid in a candy store, especially if you're interested in this kind of stuff. It's like, oh my gosh, look, there it is. It's right there. <laughs> so I think that was a really um, amazing opportunity. Yeah, maybe we had blinders on and we couldn't see like the frustration or anything oh, like that. Like, sure. We were just so excited to be down there, to be quite mm -hmm. honest. Mm-hmm, absolutely. Well, I mean, part of the problem was that uh, there were little, if we were lucky, little thumb, thumbnail images of each piece, you know, in the, 
in the uh, list of uh, list of works, uh, you know, pretty inadequate to try to make decisions by. But but we did have access to the archival boxes, particularly mm. for the photography. So if you had the time, you know, you could spend hours and hours sort of going through an amazing collection of photography. Mm. You know that this is one of the things that the Corcoran really you know was uh, was excelled at. You know, amazing collection of photography. Mm -hmm. Some students did go through it for hours and hours. Yeah. And they got A's, too, by the way. You know. Did I? I don't even know that I've checked my grade. <laughs> well. I, I just assumed. <laughs> Let's see. Um, so, Erica, tell us about how you came to focus on your topic. Um, your very poetic oh. and uh, emotional topic, I think. It, it was definitely a very emotional topic. Um, so I had originally started out thinking I would be with a group, and unfortunately in March my grandmother had a heart attack, which uh, later that summer proved to be fatal, but um, I, I had to be gone a lot. So I wanted to think of something that was really dynamic, uh, something that I could really sink my teeth into, but also be prepared that if I had to leave during the semester, it was something that... I wouldn't leave a burden on anyone else. So that's why I worked alone. And uh, when I got to thinking and looking at the collection, I really wanted something that I understood. Because as you heard, my background is in music. I really had no art, uh, <laughs> no art uh, experience at all. So I thought to myself, if I could find something topically that I could relate uh, with the art and then relate with the audience, then I would have found what I wanted. And I definitely found that with um, the pieces behind us, which this is, this is my wall. Um, <laughs> I found that because my, my largest theme was the strength in family and the strength in home. And, um, you know, it, in addition to place being such an important indicator of that, I could always think of these very strong stories that um, my mom and dad and grandmother had always told me about how they grew up and how very fortunate I was not to be in those circumstances. And, um, you know, after my mother and grandmother died, it was, it was very easy to take a look at the, the more sullen nature of these photos, how the houses are a little broken or things aren't quite as they quite as picturesque as you want them to seem, but it, deep in them, even though there's some brokenness, there is beauty. And that's really what attracted me to both portfolios as well as um, Gail's work. And um, I think that was what spoke to me and what then led me to this topic. Thank you. Nicely said. Thank you. So uh, Abby and Michael worked on really this wonderful I think wonderfully curated section of the show called Thank American you. Legacy, reconsidering non-Western subjects in the Corcoran collection. And if you get a chance to sort of look at some of the the pairings they put together for this uh, show, I think it's uh, pretty wonderful. Could you tell us a little bit about how each of you sort of got into this subject and uh, and where you took it? Right. So I think Mike and I working together in a group was sort of a no-brainer for us. Um, we're both in the art history program, we both respect each other's perspective, and we're also really close friends. So we definitely knew we wanted to work together. Um, so as you heard, we went and we looked through the racks of paintings, and similar, when you think about going through 9,000 works, you need some sort of perspective. And just like I do in an art history paper, I had a research question that I really wanted to answer when I first went to the facility. Um, and mine was, I just wanted to know what had the Corcoran collection naturalized? And I went in looking for that answer. Um, I definitely noticed as we were looking through and I was talking to Mike, we definitely noticed that most of the depictions of subjects of color were painted by white persons. And that was sort of our jumping off point. We definitely knew that we had to do something with this. Um, and that's how we ended up um, getting started on our, our group. We ended up talking to several others, other students who were interested in works that sort of fit in that category and we formed our group. Yeah, and uh, one of the most helpful things was, Jack, you having us write proposals of 
what do you see what do you see can be done with this collection and then he had us present in front of everybody like how many students to be like hey I'm Michael and I want to work on orientalism and then someone in the crowd would be like oh well, I want to work in that too you know and so they would come up to me after and all that um, but before I even continue, I want to give all credit to my selection, which is Rebecca at the well over here, to um, the registrar, Carla. She, uh, I went in actually wanting to work on still life uh, with oriental items, I believe, oriental objects, I believe it's called. And she's like, oh, well, if you, know, if you want to work in, like, in that. And she just pulled me aside to like the edge of the, of the storage racks all the way to the back, turned on some lights, and then I saw her right there. And I was like, that's it. That's my painting. Thank you, Carla. So Carla Galfano is, um, she's definitely the reason I started working on that. Um, but yeah, so we shared ideas with each other and a a Abby's idea was exactly what I wanted to do. So again, it's a no-brainer. So talk a little bit about Rebecca at the Well. So uh, Rebecca at the Well is, is uh, an 1852 painting. So I want to say it's the oldest thing. It might be. It's up there. Um, it's an 1852 painting by the artist Thomas Rossiter, who was in the same circles as the Hudson River School painters in the 1800s. Um, this guy, he made a living doing religious subjects and small landscapes, which were not very good, to be quite honest. Uh, but he made his, his bread doing these depictions of religious figures. And so what I argue is that, well, the program here at AU teaches you to look at the objects that you're researching, but look at the social history. What's going on around the paintings? What's happening that might inform the artists and what they're doing? I noticed that in 1852, it was just a couple of years after the Seneca Falls Convention, which was one of the first, first conventions where women started really fighting for their rights as wives, um, just more rights in marriage because they're, and this is a quote that I found from a source that they were basically um, deemed dead when they got married. They had no legal rights. They had no representation in anything. They had no voting, anything like that. So I found it a little odd that Thomas Pro uh, Richard Prositor, Rositor, um, made this painting glorifying marriage because this is the story of Rebecca at the well who basically leaves everything because a guy came up to her and was like, God wants you to marry this guy. Come on over, leave your family, leave everything you got, and I promise you it'll be okay. And of course, like the Bible, it's okay. Like she ends up having a really good life. But that's a really odd thing to proclaim when women are fighting to redefine what marriage means. And so that's what I go into in my catalog uh, essay. That was my research question when I was looking at this. Um, and here it is. Uh, now, you did the pairing, right? Oh, I didn't, no, I didn't do the pairing. Okay. Uh, that was Elizabeth, but um, again, another reason why our group kind of formed was because we all wanted to work on the same paintings. And so Elizabeth was like, I want to pair Rebecca at the Well with the Turkish Bath. And I said, well, I want to work on Rebecca at the Well too. Well, let's just be in a group together then. <laughs> yeah. And so um, Elizabeth Van Brun, she, she did this amazing pairing that basically compares, would you say compares like Orientalism? Um, one, my painting, Rebecca at the Well, is the standard definition of Orientalism, which is a fantasy, a mishmash of uh, Middle Eastern Asian culture made by a white man for a white audience. Whereas Elizabeth's work, and I can't speak on it because obviously she's not here, but I'll try, is inverting that, is subverting that trope and really reflecting it back on the audience. Obviously, it's a contemporary artist doing it now. And so the pairing is just fantastic when you look at the two together. Abby, could you talk a little bit about yours? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I first saw, I ended up working on the painting Still Life with Oriental Objects by Fanny S. Ains. It's from 1931, and I paired it with a print by Hung Liu, um, Children at Work, Boy with Pots, from uh, 2000. And I initially actually saw the Hung Liu print hanging in the facilities, and it was sort of in a spot. There were, at the time we were looking, there was a section that was the AU collection that we already had, and it was sort of mixed, unclear division of where the Corcoran started. And I thought, oh, I really hope that's part of the gift. 
Um, I found out it was, which was great because I actually was really interested in Hung Liu's work. Um, during my freshman year of my BFA, I saw um, a show by Hung Liu at the uh, Kemper Museum of Contemporary Art, and it had a really profound impact on me. And so I definitely knew I, ha I had to work with this print. Um, and I ended up finding this painting by Fanny S. Eanes, and I just thought, these are perfect, I have to compare these um, to start posing some questions. And some of the questions that I um, came up with had a lot to do with gender and subject. I was really interested that they both um, use still life and they also both use Orientalism. Um, for me, I definitely saw the Eanes painting. So Fanny S. Eanes actually studied at the Corcoran School. Um, she was much older when she actually started um, with her male colleagues. I believe she was in her 50s when she started. And she actually had worked as a school teacher and she had worked in a bank before um, taking classes there. There's not a lot written about her. However, she has a huge body of work. Um, and she actually donated almost 250 paintings to the Corcoran um, when she died. Um, and um, I saw her work as sort of using Orientalism to boost her career actually, and I saw Hung Liu's print um, as self-orientalizing as well, but in quite a smart way. I saw her as commenting on neo-orientalist appetites for a Western audience, um, and knowing that people were interested in those subjects, and she does it uh, to herself on purpose. And just to jump off that, like as you can see, there's a lot of subversion in our little group. Whereas we're we're showing audiences what usually we leave subversion to the artists, but <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> that we are. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of subversion, and we got that from um, one of your lectures and something that we were looking on in our American art class too was Fred Wilson's mining the museum at the Maryland Institute of History. Um, no, it was the Maryland Historical Society. Maryland Historical Society, and a Abby said it perfectly. So I'm taking her quote. Um, once we had that framework of somebody using a collection to criticize the collection, there's no way we could have worked in any other frame. We had actually learned about um, when Jack introduced us uh, to the Mining the Museum project by Fred Wilson, we had actually already been talking about it in a class with Dr. Nika Elder here. Elder here. And so it was something that was really moving for us. Um, and so we definitely, yeah, we definitely had to use that. So I think at this point we should uh, see if there are any questions from the audience, if anybody would like to talk a little bit. Yes? I think we got a microphone coming for you. Hold on. So some of us uh, haven't lived here for long. Could you tell us a little bit about the history of the Corcoran? Because you sort of jump from the point where they collapse, and so why did they collapse? Did you... Con I know very little. I'm Chuck Kaufman. I, I know very little about the Corcoran except that I've been there several times and I was impressed with their current uh, or recent shows. Uh, uh, but he did that, they did that wonderful show. What's his name? But, Batinsky? Or the the uh, aerial views of the oil wells. But I... I'm not familiar with the depth and collection of, of the Corcoran, so I can't help you. <laughs> Anybody want to talk about the Corcoran? I mean, uh, you know, the, the, the Corcoran was... Uh, I don't know, Jack. It definitely sounds like your Ballywick. I'm sorry? Say I said it definitely sounds like your Ballywick. <laughs> um, well, it was, uh, like I said, it was the center of Washington art. It was, it was uh, founded in the, I believe, the 1800s, the 1890s, something like that. I'm sorry, I don't have the information on my, but, but it was the, uh, it, first of all, it was, it was the National Museum for a long time, before the Smithsonian started. Uh, you know, the Corcoran was it. And, uh, and then when the Corcoran, when the, 
when the Smithsonian Museum started to come along, the National Gallery and you know Smithsonian American Art Museum, etc., they were all funded by uh, federal money, and the Corcoran was private, and so the Corcoran had to charge admission, and um, that was a big problem. It was it was under uh, under endowed so that uh, it was very difficult to survive as, as time went on and the competition, this is a great city of museums, almost all of them are free. Then, then the Corcoran's uh, location on the mall became a real problem. It was so close to the uh, White House after 9-11, uh, there were all kinds of restrictions about what they could do, like no buses could even stop in front of the Corcoran. You know, so, and uh, and there were there were a few poor decisions made over time, as everybody knows. Um, there are some great stories about major catastrophes at the Corcoran uh, that uh, happened over time. There was you know possibly a curse was placed on them. I don't know, but they had a very very difficult time, and they and they um, made it to 2014, but uh, it no longer became tenable to. Uh, to continue. Anybody want to argue with that? They had a number of very, very significant artists who, they, they had a number of very significant artists who still live in the area who were teachers there. They had a great faculty. There was the biggest employer of artists definitely in the region. I think that, that was one of the major losses was that the source of income for artists. But, uh, Sorry. Um, and something that I found in my research about Cor uh, Corcoran himself was when he was collecting, he was actually, so he was, he bought my painting, Tom, uh, Rebecca. It was contemporary art back then. It was, he was buying landscape paintings. He was buying things that we now consider like in the American art canon. And so again, that just goes to show like, huh, this was a pretty important collection because he, Okay, if you want to talk about it, Corcoran supporting the arts and arts educating uh, educators and whatnot, he was also supporting local artists. He was also supporting artists too, which is very important. One of the one of the uh, goals when we were going after works from the Corcoran, we wanted to keep collections together wherever possible. So we worked very hard to get uh, William C. Clark's collection. There was an interesting guy. If you ever want to do research on William C. Clark. Um, he stole an election twice to be senator from Montana. Twice he did it. And, um, and uh, there's a glass case outside the museum uh, that now houses a, a number of Greek vases that were in his house in a glass case. Uh, and uh, it's just kind of fun to sort of, you know, try to remember and duplicate, you know, what was going on back then, but uh, is a classic example, is a robber baron uh, a, and uh, uh, il perfect illustration of uh, behind every great philanthropy is a great crime, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, well. Ash, don't say that. Kathleen. So I was just going to add to the discussion about the very early history of the Corcoran, of which I'm no authority whatsoever, but I happened to see an exhibit recently, and I was at the Renwick Gallery because that was the original Corcoran building, and so I really noticed it because we were going to be having this show here, but just as was pointed out, this picture here was the 1850s, collected by Corcoran himself, and when the Renwick opened, which was before the Civil War, it was a big deal in ar the arts in Washington, D.C., so close to the White House, according to the exhibit that I saw. It made the arts very prominent in Washington. Remember, of course, there was no Kennedy Center. There was the Smithsonian Museums weren't there. There was no National Gallery. So this was really a big thing. The downside was that Corcoran was kind of a Southern sympathizer. Yep. And so he got out of town during the Civil War and then came back after 
and kind of to get back into um, a, a better repute, he collected more American art than after he came back. And eventually, although it was a, a building that was built as an art gallery, the Renwick, it became too small. So that's when they moved to what was now the, the Corcoran building further on down the street. And then what was the Renwick was taken over for offices. And it was offices for a long time until they redid uh, Lafayette Square and those buildings, and Jackie Kennedy insisted that those buildings not be torn down. It's part of an effort. And so then it was restored as a gallery, and you know they now have the Renwick crafts. But that exhibit is there on the second floor of the Renwick, if, if you happen to be over there. Just a little fun fact. Uh, Rebecca at the Well was exhibited at the inaugural Corcoran uh, show. So. Okay at the, either the Renwick or the new building, but it definitely had the word inaugural in there. <laughs> <laughs> and and even the, the gift of the, the Corcoran collection to form the Corcoran was, uh, was an effort to uh, clean up his reputation, if you will, you know, because he, he had this taint of being a you know, Confederate uh, sympathizer yeah, and sort of brought him back into the mainstream. So along with that, that idea of, uh, you know, philanthropists you know, and crimes. <laughs> and, oh, that's a question. You're making um, it really hard not to crack jokes up here. Okay. <laughs> we have another question over there. Oh, and thank you so much for this opportunity to have time to speak and to see this really great show. My question is about the process. We're seeing the final cut. And I'm curious if we had looked in over time as you were accepting, rejecting pieces or themes, what you might have cut and why in terms of other pairings or a piece that stands out that isn't on the walls before us now. Um, I, I, I guess I could speak a little bit to that. Um, I know there were two pairings that I really liked. One was uh, Friends After Dinner. Um, it was very dark, um, very old, I can't remember the year now, and a very um, abstract piece. And I loved the pairing together because they had such a, an odd just, juxtaposition, but it really didn't flow with what I was looking for as a theme. Um, and so that was something that I had, to, even though I really wanted to work with those two pieces, I had to critically look and say, what is my personal message here as far as what I'm trying to get across in my small section of the um, bigger um, exhibition. And so that was, that was a particularly hard cut for me. We actually had, um, I believe, two more paintings in our exhibition, or was it three? I think three. Um, I think we originally had a portrait of Ben Franklin in our group, um, and that we, we cut that because it didn't exactly fit. Um, we had limited space, and we really wanted each work to have adequate room. Um, and also, we had two works that were unfortunately cut because um, they needed restoration work. And that was unfortunate for us because we felt like it really like expanded what we were trying to talk about, but we weren't able to include them. I was just going to ask if that kind of got to what you were asking. No, thank you. No, there are 18 students who did this exhibition. 18 other students would have done an entirely different exhibition. And there are probably easily 100 other exhibitions that could have been done uh, and, and probably will be done in the future. Uh, so this is just a particular configuration dealing with the interests of these particular curators. And we actually all presented individual ideas before we even formed groups. So we all had so 18 many, different shows. 18 different <laughs> ideas. And we really had to, everyone had to sacrifice and sort of come together. Mm -hmm. And I will say something that was really uh, exciting about the whole process was to see 18 different ideas and how vastly different they were. And also with what passion people fought for their ideas to have them included. Um, and it, it was really exciting for me because, again, I'm from the rural south. I'll, I always grew up feeling like people didn't have the same interests as I was, and I, it was a kind of a 
crazy moment where I said, wow, okay, this is where I'm supposed to be because these are people who are passionate about the things that I am passionate about. And that's really important to make sure that in any room you are in, whether it's a boardroom, an art gallery, or what have you, that you're surrounded by people who are passionate about the things you're passionate about and you can um, feed off of that excitement and that passion and grow together. Um, so that was... Yeah. Well said. Any other questions? Because uh, we can now... Okay, one more question. Here we go. I just had a quick question. So given a sense, give us a sense of like how many pieces are up now versus the 9,000. That's about 90, right? So this is a tenth, about a tenth of it. Um, and so we're... Less. less wait, oh, I'm sorry. Percent? One, oh, right, right, right. Yes, one percent. Sorry, my math is terrible. We're not mathematicians up here. I'm not. <laughs> Clearly. Here, wow. Okay, so, and then the other question is, were you guys really, I mean, Jack, you said that the work came in sort of in pallets, and was this the first opportunity to kind of sort through it and make sense yes. of it? And so is some of the legacy of this first group um, that, that you all sort of, Working with the registrar started to make sense of it a little bit and structure it for Ex exactly students. right. You know, it's it's going to take a long time to get a handle on this this collection, uh, and we're sort of doing it one show at a time, if you will. You know, because as we bring bring works into the museum, we can research them, we can photograph them, we can you know document, and uh, it's just going to be a long process. Um, but yeah, it was, but things literally came in on pallets that were alphabetical. Mm -hmm. All right, so you know, this is nuts, but, uh, but that's the way they came. Yeah. I mean, jump and, off. And extremely it. difficult. I mean, these are big pallets, you know, and, and, and just, just the mechanics of trying to get the pallets into our uh, storage space to be unwrapped and then to somehow be seen. We, I still haven't seen most of the collection, you know. <laughs> But I do now have uh, the uh, database for the collection on my computer at my desk. So that's, that's kind of fun. It's a very interesting, it's a very different way of curating working from a collection because you have to begin with, uh, you know, your, your idea of what you want to see. You have to go looking for it. You can't just sort of wander around and and discover things the way you could in the racks, for example. But you have to go with intentionality, and so it's a very different process. But um, but we're, we're we're trying to get up to speed. And just to jump off that point really quick, um, one of the one of the really fun things about doing this work and researching uh, my painting was looking through the object file and seeing what other people have written about it. Um, you know, object files full of just different things from the past and all that. And it's really heartwarming to know that my wall text and my essay is going to go into that object file so that when somebody pulls it out maybe 10, 15 years from now. And by the way, this is a great catalog that goes with this exhibition. I mean, the, with essays by each of the students and it's a really, it's a wonderful, I think, a wonderful document. Maybe one more. Would, would there have been value in preserving the Corcoran selling off some works. I assume that the quantity of those works is billions of dollars uh, on the market. Uh, it, it struck me when I was reading about it that it should have been preserved, sell off something. That's an interesting question. Uh, it raises all kinds of ethical problems for museums to sell off your collection to support the support the operation because really you're holding these works in trust for the you know for the people but you're right and on the other hand you've you know lost a great institution and all the uh, you know opportunities that affords it's a it's a it's a big problem yeah and, and my own feeling at the time was uh, it was a grand situation Um, just, I, just to speak a little bit on that, if you'll, if you'll allow me. I'll indulge you. Oh, thank you. Uh, it, so, as an arts manager, of course, we don't ever like to see institutions go under for whatever reason, right? Um, but I think now that it has, and this is the situation we're in, 
we have to look for the positives moving forward and seeing our past mistakes or choices, whatever they may be, and learning from them and saying, okay, this happened to Corcoran, which was such a central, um, a, a central paragon of art and learning, uh, which did do a lot as far as, like you mentioned, employing people and, and saying, where did it go wrong? Kind of doing a, a diagnostic on it now that it's gone and saying, how can we further preserve what we have left and how can we not make those mistakes again? And I think that's a one, like your original question, of course, is a wonderful question, but you know, to pose a question with a question is how do we go from here to make sure something like this doesn't happen again and we preserve and appreciate our art institutions um, in, a, in a productive way. So let's end on that note. Thank you very much for coming and thank you, panel. You were terrific. Thank you, Jack. Thanks, Jack. Thanks.